his name. Hey, the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. That's what we're going to call on today. And we're going to talk about Jesus. Amen. There's nothing else that we'll talk about. Every service, we'll talk about Jesus. Amen. Because he's the only one. Touching him is all that really matters. We can touch each other and hug and shake hands and all that, but you get one touch from God. You'll never be the same. Amen. 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 Good to be in the house of the Lord. Good to have kind of everybody back. Uh, Brother Boyd and Sister Janet's uh, taking a little vacay this weekend and getting away from from the uh, from the uh, burden of, it's not a burden, but from just taking care of life. Right. Amen. It's, it's good to do that every once in a while. We, we're human as human can be, and and uh, we all have troubles and trials, and kind of sometimes you need to clear your head out, you know. So, um, um, and also June's at her dad's. He's still having uh, trouble seeing, uh, and can't. I mean, he can't get out because he can't see well enough. He can't drive or anything. So they're really having. She give her brother a little rest this weekend because he's been. He's actually going to be living over there with him sooner or later from Charleston, so she's over there kind of giving him a weekend off, and then she'll be back tomorrow. She's uh, watching in now, so she just sent me a message. Also, she said, tell Sister Julie Krantz that your honey is downstairs. Your honey's right there beside of you, but the liquid honey is downstairs. Jim's got for you. Okay. She wanted me to make sure to tell you that. All right, by way of announcement, this coming Wednesday, Brother Aaron will be ministering for us. All right, also remember on Tuesday, though, this coming Tuesday, the 11th, I'll be having a heart catheterization. Say that a couple of times. So I'll have a heart cath at 7.30 in the morning. They're going to go in and see if I've got any blockages and go through my arm and, and do, do, a, uh, do a complete test just to see how everything's going. So we pray that all that's well. They may have to put a shunt in or, they may, or a stent. Or they, the worst the worst is bypass surgery. So we're not going to believe that. No, mm -mm, no, we're going in with confidence that God's going to do what he can do. Listen, they ain't, they, they ain't a doctor on this earth has ever healed anybody. From the dawn of time till now, there's not a doctor walked in and said, we've healed you. No, they assist. Amen. That's why they call it a practice. They practice. Right, Brother Kyle? They practice. They're practicing all the time, he said. All right, so just remember that on Tuesday also, if all goes well, Jen and I are going to leave Thursday, and we're going to go to Illinois for the last of the hunt, a deer hunt up there. And also, Brother Richard Hyatt said to tell y'all hello. He has got back from, I don't know if some of you didn't know, he, he took his wife to Mexico. She has Lyme disease. And Lyme disease is awful because you can't, it's no cure in the United States. But there's been some clinical tests in Mexico, and they were down there for two weeks after, right after Christmas. She said she's doing a lot better, but she's really tired. So I'm going to go preach for him next Sunday. And Brother Bob will be doing both services this coming Sunday if everything goes well with the hard calf, okay? <clears throat> also remember, uh, let's get down to Brother January the 22nd. Brother Darrell Ward will be here. That will be our youth service. Uh, I was talking to the sisters downstairs, and June and I have been discussing. I think we're going to have soup and and uh, maybe soup and chili and sandwiches, so we all need to all get together uh, between now and then and figure out what to, to get. I know pizza's easy, but... It's also expensive, so we'll cut down on our cost a little bit. By uh, it'll be it'll be cool, it'll be cold in January. So soup and soup and sandwiches sounds good to me. Also on January twenty third, brother Darrell will be here, and there'll only be one service. Remember our Valentine's banquet will be February the fifth at four o'clock. Downstairs is a sign up sheet to sign up if you are coming. All right, everybody got that? We'll be announcing over and over again. <clears throat> also, I spoke with Brother Dale the other day. We're going to have an Easter meeting this year. Easter is deep into April. It's like the 15th, 16th, and 17th. So we're going to have a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday service. All right? That okay? Amen? And uh, I can't even read my own writing. Brother Mike Oltig will be here. Also, Brother Tim Crofts will be here. So I've already talked to those two. And Brother Mike said, tell y'all hello. He's, been, he's preached about six times. You know, he had uh, open heart surgery a few months ago, and he's doing a lot better, so let's just remember him in prayer. There's they so much to pray about. The list has got so long till uh, sometimes I just, last night I said, Lord, there's a list, and I can't remember all of it. I said, but just remember them people on that list. So uh, 
Amen. So let's just remember all those. And we all have needs, all things that are going on in life with all this COVID junk. You know, Sister Ruth is out. She's got it. You know, they announced that. So <clears throat> just stay away if you're sick and wear a mask if you want to. Um, I don't think this one's as bad as the other one is, but still it's bad. It's bad to be sick. It's just bad to be sick. It's bad to get old, but it's bad to be old and sick. And that's what I'm getting, old and sick. So anyway, so um, all those announcements, I know that you, sometimes you don't hear them all, but I have got them online where you can, where you can remember them. So let's just remember those things coming up. <clears throat> Pray for the needs of, of Brother Luis. He sounded really um, tired the other day when he sent that message to us, and he's uh, he's doing seven weeks of work. I mean, seven straight weeks of nothing but preaching, traveling, and he's doing a real good job, and I believe the Lord just gave him some really good fruit for that labor. Amen. And when he gets back, the Lord will give him a rejuvenation because you know what? When he comes back, he's got to go back to work. Right. Then he's got to go back to the same old grind that, that he was in, you know, before. I, I know how that is because I went to the Philippines for three weeks the first time I went, and, man, it was great. But, boy, when you come back, everything piles up because your your life don't stop. It just keeps moving. And as you when you get home, it's just, boom, dropped on top of you. So, so let's just remember Brother Luis. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to continue on who is this son of man. We're going to talk a little bit about the headstone today. Amen? <clears throat> who is the headstone? Jesus Christ. Head of the church. Our bridegroom. Amen? So let's bow our head. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to speak to the greatest people that ever walked on the face of the earth. They may be great athletes or great this or great that, but Lord, there'll never be a greater group of people than the bride of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that you would be with us and bind us together and help us to stay together, Lord, and pray over these sicknesses and, and bind the devil where he can't work in between us and where he can't get between us and Lord, where you'll just, Lord, hold your bride closer and closer. Now, toward the end, Father, we pray that you would just continue to give us revelation. We come here today to hear from you, Lord. I was thinking last night, Father, talking to you, I, I know one thing's for sure. The prophet said we are better or worse when we leave this service. And just to be honest, sometimes we're a little worse because we don't get everything that we need. But, Father, I pray today that everybody will be better that we'll get a better revelation, a better time in you, a better something that will help us to grow in grace and knowledge. And only you can do that, Lord. But we have to have that desire. Today, we've come to church with a desire to hear from you, Lord. Now, I pray that you would speak to the people, be with all the ones that are sick, Lord, the ones that are in this uh, sanctuary, Lord, that are sick, and the ones outside the sanctuary. I pray that you'd be with them, be with the ones that are traveling. Bless our pastor, Lord, and keep him strengthened and keep him strong. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> this would be part 14. <clears throat> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the world. Let's go to verse 10. I kind of cut through some of that. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Now, here's the Creator. Now, listen, everybody in this building knows who Henry Ford is. Right? He created the first automobile. Amen? Amen? So we know who that is. We've got books about his life. And, but this man that created the world don't know who he is. Amen? We know who this one is and who that one is by history, but the world knew him not. That's why we have to come out of the world to know him. You'll only know him by the Holy Ghost, and that means you've come out of the world to get into him. All right? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So he came to the religious world, he came to those people and they kicked him out. Okay? But as many as received him. Amen. See, there's your out. There's your way back. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And that word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. <coughs> the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, Full of grace, not partial, not barely, uh-uh, full of grace and truth. You may be seeing the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. Let's go to Hebrews 10, 5. Because when we talk about a body, a body, listen, <clears throat> Hebrews 10, 5. 
Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast there prepared me. Now let's go to Ephesians 5, verse 23, and we'll comment on this just for a few minutes. I was thinking about something this morning that we really need to cover. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So he's bridegroom, we're bride. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Only one. He's our husband. Our old husband had to die or we're living in adultery. Amen? <clears throat> All right, so even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Now, he didn't need his body saved. You need to be saved. Amen? His body need to be made eternal, but it didn't have to be saved from sin because it was sinless. Amen? He was a sinless man. <clears throat> came the right way. Came the way he was supposed to. All right, so now let's look at this, though, because go back to the next scripture, to Hebrews 10, 5. But a body hast thou prepared me. Actually, he had to prepare two bodies. Now, it's the same body. But remember, there was no bride body on the earth. Amen? Because what happened was in the Garden of Eden, there, had, there was supposed to be, listen, the bride was supposed to be in the Garden of Eden. His bride. Not Eve. Us. Amen? The Genesis 1.26 was supposed to be developed in the Garden of Eden where there was, there was no fall. And we were to be married and we were to live forever and ever and do the things, you know, that we're, that we're going to do in the, in the future home. Yeah. Amen? But listen to this. He had to literally come down in, and uh, prepare a body, a baby, like we just went through. All right? But he was also preparing a spiritual body because... It wasn't the natural body anymore because in the Garden of Eden, the marriage vows, Eve committed adultery against Adam. Amen? So there's no way Jesus Christ could come through that. Amen? That's why he had to come in human flesh. That's why he had to be the son of man because you get saved by the son of man. The son of God saves you, but you have to go through the son of man to get to him because all the Father has given me will come to me. Amen. Amen? So we know they're the same person, but you got to go through Jesus Christ to get to, to God. Amen? So he had a literal body that was created by a creative act of, as Bob was talking about, of germ and, and uh, egg. Creative. Nothing we did. Nothing anybody did. Nothing even Mary did. But it was a creative act to bring though a literal body to come through a literal womb because that's where it all got messed up in the beginning. Uh, we all know that, but I'm setting a stage here. <clears throat> it was marred in the garden so there's no, there's no bride could come with flesh. Think about this. There was no bride could come. He, he, he brought Eve out of Adam. She was the same flesh as him. And then we were to come forth, I believe, by the spoken word of God. Amen. Amen. Just like we're spoken word children now. But the marriage vows got marred. Not the vows, but the literal act got marred. So that couldn't happen. So then there had to be one come. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child. 4,000 years later, here come the word made flesh. But now what was his job? It was to prepare himself a body and then prepare that spiritual body that he was going to have, which turned into a literal body. I think we count literal now. And if you're born again, you're already the bride of Jesus Christ. You're not going to be. Listen, he hasn't reversed the effects of the fall in this thing yet, but that's what we're looking toward. That's what we're looking. The Son of Man is now glorified in a glorified body that came marred, not by sin, but it was marked because it had to come into this world. Hey, you're 50 years old. He was 30 and he looked 50. That body was wore out. But in the resurrection, in the resurrection, oh, I know why the, the, uh, the Mary couldn't recognize him and I know why Cleopas and him couldn't recognize him. He was a young man. Their eyes were withholding because he had turned back to a young guy. He didn't look like that right there. Right. He looked like a young 20-year-old man. Amen. He didn't look old. 
Like they saw him as old. But what's the first thing he did though? He comes to the earth, preaches his first sermon, ye must be born again. In other words, what happened in the garden, I've come to reverse that effect. I know you're married to another husband. We're not going to get in marriage and divorce, but you have to cover it. You're married to another husband. That husband's got to die. Nicodemus, that old husband has got to die. Nicodemus could never get that old husband killed because he kept looking back to the law. He kept looking back to the Old Testament. Sure, he believed Jesus was something, but I don't think he believed he was Almighty God, maybe a prophet. But he did the best he could with what he had. He wasn't supposed to see it. So there was a literal body on earth that came on the earth to not get married. Literal. Let's talk literal. Natural body. Jesus never got married on the earth. He could have, but he never got married. He could have had a wife, Brother Brown said. He was a man. But see, that would have marred the plan. He would come, to, he come after a spiritual bride. There was no natural bride on the earth that was worthy of this man. Sorry. Were you worthy? No, but when he came, he made you. Remember the song? He made me worthy. And now by his grace. Amen? He made me worthy. He had to give his life. And that's what we've been talking about. The son of man had to die. You can't kill the son of God. The son of God's the creator God. And, you know, and Jordan, what Chris said, was talking about this weekend, it kind of just dovetailed right into what we were, what we've been talking about, and we did not discuss it. I'm just not going to discuss stuff, stuff, I don't mean stuff, I'm not going to discuss the stuff I've been preaching, because you get each other's spirit and you carry it on. I want him to preach what God gave him, and then let you decide whether it was God or not that did it, amen? Whether the Holy Ghost was leading him or whether it was just something notes he had wrote down, same thing with me today. So let's go to Colossians 1, verse 15. Ephesians 5 says the husband is the head of the wife. And that's what we're talking. We're going to talk about a little bit about the headstone after we get a little more background here. We're going to talk about the headstone <clears throat> to the church. But we got to get him here first. We got to get him in human flesh here first so he can die. So he can send back not the human flesh of Jesus, but send back the spirit to go into your flesh and make you the wife of Jesus Christ. The bride of Jesus Christ. So Colossians 1 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? So in other words, he came the right way. He came the way he was supposed to come. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. What a God. But now look, verse 18. And he's head of the body, the church. All these great things that he is, creator. He come to get a body of believers and take us back to where there's no fall. There's your eternal plan of redemption. And he is the head of the body, the church, or the bride, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminences. So he was the firstborn. Listen, he was the first one to resurrect and never die again. Now listen, Lazarus resurrected. There was the bones of Elisha. Somebody was thrown on the bones of Elisha and somebody, but they died. Everybody had been raised from the dead. They went ahead, they died. Even Lazarus had to die. But this man died and raised again. He never had to die again. Amen. <clears throat> we know all the scriptures on that too. Look, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And that's what we're trying, trying to get to is where Brother Brown tells us that you and I are the complete bride of Jesus Christ. And being the complete bride of Jesus Christ, you're the fullness of the Godhead body. Not in one person, but as a collective body. Body of believers. That's why... I hate people that are critical about, well, this one don't have any depth or this one don't have any, this one's shallow. That's none of your business. There's people that have a pinky. 
And that's what they are. They're the pinky. But you know what? They can cut that thing off. You have trouble picking stuff up. If you shun any of the fivefold ministry, you're wrong. If that fivefold ministry was sent from God, I don't care how shallow he is. I don't, there's nothing shallow about the Word of God. There's nothing shallow about a man standing here and giving his heart. And if he preaches on God for the love of the world that he gave his only begotten son, you should be happy about that. Amen? Sometimes we get so revelated we don't have any business saying what we say, but that's okay. You'll learn one day that you probably don't know much either. I don't. I don't claim to. I claim to come right here and stand and let him do the talking. Amen? So I, and I think that's what all preachers do. They're supposed to preach. So maybe you're not, but that's not your business either. You don't put them in the pulpit and you can't take them out. Amen? For it pleased the Father that he and him should all fullness dwell. Now if all that fullness dwelled in that man and he's the head of the church, where's that fullness got to land? It's got to land in the church. But him being the head of it all, he had to come and reverse the effect of the fall and give us eternal life. So look at number one quote. We've read it many times in the masterpiece. Brother Abraham said, The body was built by the word which was the prophets. And here comes the head of it all. Now this is the literal body of God. This is in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they spoke of God coming literally in human flesh. Right? So that's what he had to do. If they spoke the word of God, and that's what came from the mind of God, and that's what they spoke when Isaiah said, a virgin shall conceive, there's no way anybody could stop that. It had to happen. So God had to come down into human flesh and be on the earth. Listen, folks. That's a word of promise. From the Old Testament, that was a word of promise that Jesus stood on, just like Brother Bob was talking about Abraham. Abraham got a promise. He stood on the promise. He didn't worry about what somebody else said. He didn't worry about his circumstances. He stood on the promise of God, even though he had all kind of faults and failures. We keep dwelling on our faults and failures, and we're going to stay here another 30 years. Hopefully not. So look, and here comes the head of it all, Jesus come on the scene. So now we know for a fact Jesus was the head of the church. Now then this head piece was put upon it. We find in him the entire handiwork of God. So now we're going to talk about this afternoon, probably not this morning. We're going to talk about the statue of a perfect man. But we had to have someone that lived it first to its perfection. Because see, Paul, Peter... All the, all the saints, they lived all this, but they were not the headstone. The Bible says the headstone was rejected. So it had to be what? Uh, let's just put it this way. It disappeared. It, we know he didn't, but it, dis, it, dis, it did disappear from the earth because when, head, when the headstone left, he went up. The total fullness of God. The faith of Jesus Christ, the virtue of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the temperance of Jesus Christ, the patience of God, all those were his character. But without that head, I'll read you a quote this afternoon, just like I read it a little, few days ago. Brother Brown said, the church ages got just enough of the Holy Ghost to make it through. Believe on Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved, live a good Christian life, do what your messenger to your age says, and then you're going to be hid away in that sixth dimension. But somebody, somebody has got to bring that head back because that's what resurrected. Jesus didn't resurrect without a head. The fullness of the Godhead bodily resurrected. And then he sent it back into the church but what did they reject? I'm sorry. They rejected Jesus in human flesh. Sorry, because the Son of God is how you get born again. That's not Jesus in human flesh. It's through Jesus in human flesh that you get born again. Everybody understand that? Without him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But you know, he stood one day and he said, there's no man good but God. Now he's standing there. The perfect image of God. 
In other words, he was saying, hey, oh, easy. Who you calling perfect? That's what the Pharisees were talking about. He said, who you calling perfect? He said, there's only one. We know where he was at. But still, you look at Jesus. He, had, he didn't have faults and failures. But the Bible said he learned by the things that he suffered. We'll talk about that in just a second. Or maybe this afternoon. I don't know whether I got my notes in there or not. So there had to be a beginning of this creation. The headstone had to stay where it was at. Son of man. Sent back to, on Pentecost, he sent back the baptism of the Holy Ghost to start his body. Not start his head. He is the head. But he came to start his body. Everybody got that? Amen. Come to start the body. But now the body by itself can't take a resurrection. It takes the body with the head to take, come to the resurrection. Everybody got that? Then, then why didn't they have take a rapture in the first church age? Second church age? Third, fourth, fifth? Even in the seventh that we call Laodicea. I've never thought about that, though. He did start the body. The body of God started on the day of Pentecost. But never was the Son of Man understood anymore until now. Now, Peter and Paul and James and all those different ones, they had great signs and wonders. Right? And that's what we were supposed to be called back to by this prophet of Malachi 4, to be called back to the faith of the fathers. All right, which is right here down. We still got that to deal with. Because we're going to read here tomorrow or tonight where Brother Brown says we're not complete without him. The church is not complete until that headstone comes down and unites with the body. Now listen, we're not, and don't get me wrong, we're not a bunch of mindless people. Paul said we have the mind of Christ. But we're talking about God back in human flesh again, just like he walked on the shores of Galilee. I'll read you a quote tonight where Brother Brown said, he said, a ministry just like what walked on the earth. Just like what walked on the earth is what's going to take us out of here. Not one word off. Was Jesus one word off? No. See, that's my whole dealings because we still get that problem of you ain't perfect, I ain't perfect, and... and um, I know Chris mentioned it this weekend, and, and I believe it, that we can't all agree on everything. But still, there's only one truth. Okay? One truth. And that truth has got to come through the bride. In the end time, alive and remain, something's got to be preached that's going to catch me and you and bring us to that perfection. Well, I ain't perfect and you ain't perfect. Well, now that's not what the Bible said. The Bible said, be ye therefore perfect, Amen. even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, if, if the Father had stayed in heaven, no, we wouldn't have got perfect, been able to get perfect. But see, he lowered himself. He immorphed in another form called Jesus Christ. So see, now I can understand God because he was a human man. He walked on the earth. He had to eat. He had to sleep. He had to do the things of the world. Not the things of the world, you understand, but he had to eat. He worked in the carpenter shop. He, he wasn't just like, you know, he didn't walk in air this high everywhere he went. And I don't believe that, you know, the Catholics have this little halo all the way around him all the time, you know, this little glow. Uh, no, he was hid. No one understood him. It would have been, it would have been totally, uh, it, he would have been accepted by everybody if he'd walked in, you know, and dirt just fall off of him. You know, they spit on him and it, it just gets right here and stops. You understand what I mean? And everything he did was so perfect. But he was so hid as a human being until they did not know who he was. They called him everything but God. Amen? That's the God I serve. He showed me how to do it. He showed me through Jesus Christ how to live this not say this message, to live this Bible, which is the message of the hour. And I'm like Brother Bob, there's no way in heaven or hell that you can leave this message and be born again. 
No way. You can't pull yourself away from God if you got God inside of you. Amen? You just can't do it. Hey, listen, you might get confused. We all do. You might say, well, I don't understand that, but when you say that ain't it and he's a liar and I'm leaving, no, you got a problem. But God sent us a word of promise. Watch what this is in Revelation 3.14. The angel of the church will lay out of sins, write these things, saith the amen, the faithful and true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. He's going to have a creation <coughs> just like he wanted in the Garden of Eden. <coughs> got to quit beating on the pulpit. They got on to me. I went, you know, in April, I went and preached Chris's Easter meeting, and he had a brand new pulpit sent all the way from Ohio. Some Amish had made it for him, and it's just a beautiful uh, made out of aspen and all kind of wood. And that wood's just a little bit, it's a little bit soft. It's not like oak. So I beat on it about 25 times during that weekend, and it got beats and bangs all over it. And Chris told me, he said, you know what? He said, I kind of like that. So he just took a hammer and beat, and beat all around it, put the little pop marks on it. So sorry about that. But get excited about God. You ought to try it sometime. The beginning of the creation of God. And listen to this. Let's go to Psalms 85, 9. Brother Dale preached on this long, I mean 20 years ago, I remember him preaching on this. Psalms 85, verse 9. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Now here's the book of Psalms. Here's David. Here's David, a prophet. Mercy and truth are met together. God and man become one. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth, we'll read this this afternoon a little bit different than we're reading it today. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. When God and man met, heaven and earth kissed each other. Righteousness and peace kissed each other and became a man named Jesus Christ. And man, we'll get into that a little bit more. I want to just keep going because we've got to... Oh, we've got to get to a point here. Now look, <clears throat> let's go to number two. God's gift always finds their places. It'll be all right? Amen. Amen. This new year, we, we got to go. We got to go. Amen. We just got to keep going. Amen. This new year, we got, you know, if you got, uh, if we got, we all got issues and I'm ready to get rid of them, <laughs> you ought to be able to get rid, try to get rid of yours too. Amen. Some of us, we, I'm going to stop just a minute. We baby our issues. June's got a sister that's got, she takes 75 pills a day. She's got every problem in the world. But she's kind of one of those people that, you know, if God went by and said, I'm going to heal you of everything you got, she wouldn't do it. Some people love misery. Some people love to be sick, so you can pity them. We get out of that. Hey, man, stand up and go. I don't want to feel bad. I felt bad for a year. I felt bad for a year. It's time to quit feeling bad. It's time to say, I can't come to church because my nose is itching. You know what it is? It's babies rocking babies. You don't get a lot when a baby rocks a baby. But when an adult gets a hold of a baby... Do the right thing. You sit on the front row, you're going to get picked on. But look, Brother Brown said he's a being on earth, a being of time. That's why that, that baby had to be born, according to the Old Testament, come down into time. All right, I'm getting something. Which means that he must have had a beginning. Therefore, he created himself a body to live in. God himself created a body for himself. But listen, see, it had to come by the word. Because look, as his original, as his original body, his flesh body came by the word, he couldn't have come any different because he requires that his spiritual body come the same way. Right. By the word. Yes. His spiritual body's got to come by the word because his natural body came by the word. Amen. Amen? <clears throat> so that's see, that's where we can have confidence. That God came just like he said he was going to come in the Old Testament. And you and I, according to the Old and New Testament, are going to come the exact same way. Yes. 
We got to have these virtues and they're the virtues of God. They're the virtues of God that we couldn't understand until a man walked on the shores of Galilee. And it's recorded that virtue went from him. It's recorded that he had the mind of God because he was God. Temperance, patience. We'll, we'll talk about that this afternoon. <clears throat> Created a body for himself. That by this creation, he might save the lost creation that he created. All right, now we know his body was not eternal. Yours wasn't either. All right, it's being made eternal. His was being made eternal. See how close it was? He was so hid in that flesh. Well, nobody understood who he was. Nobody did. Even the devil had questions about it. If you be the Son of God, do this. If you be. You think him being a spiritual being that was so close to that spiritual being that was in heaven, he would have felt that same feeling. But God was so wrapped up in that flesh till he hid him. He hid him from the devil himself. I believe that. All right, now let's go to the next one real quick. Laodicea in church age. Now show that he was the first. How could God be created if he's a spirit? How could he be? He's eternal. He never was created. He never will be created. We're talking about the Son of God, the creator, the one that was before the foundation of the world. But remember, there's an enmorphy or a changing of form of this man you can't understand to a man you can't understand. can understand. All right? How could it be? He's eternal. He never was created. He never will be created because he was God at the beginning. Listen. He was so head to the world, but don't we know how he was supposed to come? Didn't the prophets know how he was supposed to come? They saw a vision. That vision was projected on a piece of paper called an Old Testament. What was written in the Old Testament, all of us can pick up today and read scriptures about this man I'm talking about. Right? So is it head to the world? Yes, but for those of us that can read the Bible... And have the new birth as an open book for us. Yes. So we can read that he came exactly the way he was supposed to come. You and I are coming exactly the way we're supposed to come. You say, no, this is a mess. Well, listen, in all this mess, we're going to be blessed. Amen. God's going to get the glory because Satan says, hey, I got dibs on that. I got dibs on that. Because you came the wrong way. You came the way I made you come in the garden. And God's like, okay, that's fine. But I'm going to create myself a body. Ain't going to come from what you said was in the garden. I'm going to create one. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to save that group of people. What a mighty God we serve. Where's Sister Johnny when you need her? What a mighty God we serve. But he that is the beginning of the creation of God was Jesus Christ when he was made manifest. In other words, when the word of promise was unveiled. What is God? What is Jesus Christ? He's God unveiled, veiled in human flesh, but unveiled to me and you. Amen? The book was closed, now the book's open. He's the beginning of the creation of God. He came down and lived in it. Oh, isn't he wonderful? And what did he want? What broke in the Garden of Eden that God wanted back? Fellowship. He said, Adam, I can't fellowship with you no more. Eve, I can't fellowship with you no more. You've got to go out of the presence of God. I've got to drive you out because I can't stand what you just did. Man? But there was a blood covering that God was looking through when that happened. If not, he'd had to kill them and start over again. So there was a blood covering. But God wanted that fellowship back where he could walk down the cool of the day and say, Hey, Adam, how you doing? Because that's what he's going to do when we get to the future home. I believe we're going to be able to see Jesus anytime we want to. And he's going to say, Hey, how you doing? You having a good day today? Yeah, man, I've been over in, I've been in Antarctica for about 50 million years. Over walking around on that ice. It's pretty warm over there. Isn't that the way you go? Do you not think that? Man, I think that way. And I want God to show me things of how the world developed. How the world literally developed. Now, not all the sin and junk, but I want to see how this one, 
They said that, you know, that we populated North America when we come over the, from Russia to the polar ice. You know, they walked across that bridge or whatever it was. And I'd like to see that. You know what? He said he'd give you the desire of your heart. And we won't need a big old screen up there. All you do is just say, I want to be there. And you'll be standing where you're supposed to be. See, that's what we're heading to. But you know what? That's what God was before this started too. I'll be here. How can God be right here talking to, talking to this brother and be in China saving another brother? Remember, it's a personal revelation, so he's got to be the person. How can he do that? Only God can do that. I, don't, I can't do that. See, that's why that I'm not the fullness of the Godhead bodily in one person. I was thinking about this the other night. You know, you, you take the, the whole of Christendom in the 60s, 50s, 60s. There was only a few faith healers on the earth. If you wanted to get healed, you had to go see Oral Roberts, Billy Graham, different ones, Brother Branham, right? So it was kind of closed up. All right, but now we're the fullness of the Godhead body. And we're in every country in the world. There's healings going on now in Antarctica because there's a church up there. There's believers, there's bride. Where it couldn't have happened in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. It was so, it was so pulled down to one place, you had to go to a tent to get your healing. You had to go to a community. You had to go to a, a, a meeting. You don't have to do that now. Amen. We're scattered all over the world, but it's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The fullness of this world is going to be what? It's going to be populated by what? Little Jesuses, little gods. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> oh, isn't he wonderful? Now, we know in Luke 2, verse 49, Jesus was a kid. They found him in the temple. He said, Wish not I be about my father's business. That'll be the next one. Amen. He come to Nazareth, though, and was subject unto the, his parents. Verse 52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, not statue. We, knew it. we know he grew in statue because <laughs> he would grow. But stature is that what? Development. Yeah. All right? Increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Hebrews 5 verse 8. Though he were a son, say though he were a son, and we go back to, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later about adoption. Though you're a son. Though you're a son. You're born a son of God. You're born a son in the, in the, in the economy of God. You're born a a Dale or a black or whatever you want, you're, you're born that. When you get born again, you're a born again believer. But you're a baby. You don't come full grown. You're a B A B Y. Baby. Problem is, is the 60 year old baby. And if you're 60, I'm not talking about you. Let's say 61. Not you, Brother Kyle. You're a little bit older than that. Yet learned, look, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. That's why I'm telling you, Jesus as a human being made mistakes. Not in the word. Not in the, what we say. Oh, he made a mistake. He was looking at that prostitute. No. No. He made a mistake. Like Brother Dale said, he thought God was so divine that he couldn't stump, stump his toe. I believe if he hit a rock while he was running and it hit his toe, he fell. And you know what? He probably had scrapes all the way down his arms just like you do. See, that's why I don't believe that if he, if he, if he fell 40 feet, he broke something. I'm just that way. He was so much veiled in flesh until they didn't know who he was. Like I said before, if he had come walking in the temple and, and he looked like he had a, um, a neon light, you know, you know, pulsating off of his body. And he walks in and he points his finger at the ark and has it moved with his finger. See, they have said, oh, that's God. That's God. He's finally here. No, he walked in and he said, unless you believe that I'm he, you'll die in your sins. And he probably was wiping his nose. Man had blood running off his fingers from getting in the carpenter shop with his daddy and hit the wrong nail. Y'all never done that before? <clears throat> hit these nails instead of the nails that you're supposed to hit? Yeah, that's what I thought. So you let, learn he obedience by the things which he suffered. Look, and being made perfect. 
Now listen, he came the perfect son of God. But he came as the son of man. All right? Everybody got that? I'm not saying Jesus was not perfect. In his doctrine, he was perfect. But in his humanity, they didn't know who he was. Same way with me and you. How You know, we're the bride of Jesus Christ, and here we are walking through the world. We get COVID. We have to go to the doctor. We have to go, but it's our confession. Amen. It's our confession. We got to keep confessing it. Yes. Keep confessing that you are what you are. Yes. Even though we might look horrible to the world. The day Jesus was crucified, the world said, that can't be God. God would not let that happen. Right? Caiaphas said, can't even save himself. He said he could save others, can't even save himself. Wow. What submission. He learned to bring these, now listen, I believe Jesus Christ was God Almighty in human flesh. And he didn't have to get virtue. He had it already. But he had to learn how to use it. Everybody okay with that? He had to learn how to use it. I just read he learned by the things that he suffered. He learned. That, that's why that you see Jesus' ministry started when he was 30 years old. My, he had 30 years that we don't know much about. Except for just a few minutes in the temple when he was 13 years old. So he developed. He learned virtue, knowledge. He learned how to use it. Me and you were born in sin. We were born on this side of the chasm. We didn't come with the virtue of God in us. Because Peter would have said, just let what's inside of you live. No, he said, add. Add to your faith virtue. Add to your faith knowledge. And look, he says, and being made perfect, he became the author. Huh? What is an author? He writes a book. And that book you read, and when you read the book, and he talks about himself, and you see the characteristic, and you see the word be made manifest, that's my kind of author. It's nonfiction. It was written by the man that went through it. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. Look, not just to anybody. Unto all them that obey him. Everybody got that? So Jesus came here with the virtues, but learned how to bring them through his flesh. You and I were born with a carnal mind. We don't have the virtue of God. We've got to get the new birth first. That's why we got to be born again. That's why Jesus started with his first doctrine. You got to be born again, Nicodemus. You're a good guy. But you got to be born again. Everybody okay? <clears throat> now let's skip to Matthew 3. I'm not going to get finished with this. I wanted to get to a spot. I'll get to it anyway if I have to get, get through something. John 3. <clears throat> when Jesus was baptized, he went straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. A low voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, why didn't Jesus, why didn't God, why didn't that voice go ahead and say, hear you him? Because he didn't say that to you when you got born again. He said, I'm pleased to dwell in that vessel, but you got to learn those virtues. You've got to learn that. I'm fixing to put it in you, like we're going to read in a little while. The divine nature of God has got to be put in. What is the divine nature of God? But you got to get born again first before you can quicken any of these virtues. Because, yes, I agree 100%. <clears throat> when you get born again, you get all you need for your journey. Yes. Amen. When Thomas was born, he got every part he'll ever have. He's not going to grow another one. That's right? right? Amen. Your hair might get a little longer. You might grow some fuzzy on your face. But it's always still inside of you. Right. By Amen. hormones and all that. It's not something you had to acquire. Right. All you had to do was eat. Same way with this. All you got to do is eat. Yes. They're there, but what? They're laying there. Yes. You got to learn how to control virtue. Power without character Amen. is satanic. Absolutely. 
But power with character, what is character? That's the character of God. But power with character. See, Jesus, because he's the headstone, born right the first time, he controlled all that. He so controlled himself that when he went to Calvary, he was done. He could have moved his finger. Or listen, he could have thought in his mind, I need help. And there would have been legions of angels come and just destroyed the earth and took him off that cross. But you know what? He didn't want that. He had that control. And like I said, I've always told you, all don't, you don't sin in your soul if you're born again. You don't sin in your flesh. Your flesh just isn't, it just, what? Puts it in motion. See, taste, feel, smell, and hear. That's where God and Satan both, that's that, as Chris was talking about, the conflict between God and Satan. The conflict is you. And it's in your brain. Up here. That's the conflict. You are the conflict. Aren't we the conflict? Yeah. Don't, the conflicting thing of me is, is that like Paul says, the things I would not I do, the things I do that I don't want to do, I do them anyway. Now that didn't mean that he was once a drunk and he went back to being a drunk. No, he knew he was a human being. He had desires, feelings, emotions, and all these different things that he was trying to get in control and not let it control him. See, that's our problem. Sometimes we let other things control us and that's why I read you the scripture a minute ago about having preeminence. You know what preeminence is? Complete control. Amen. That he might have the preeminences, full control of me and you. When Brother Branham stepped out of the way, that's why that's our sign. Brother Branham wasn't a son of man, but it was a sign. The sign was, Brother Branham said, what did I just say? He was so out of the way. He was so out of the picture. He didn't even know what he was saying. He said, what did I just say? And somebody would have to tell him. And remember that one time I was listening the other day, he said, I had to go back and listen to the tape to see what I said. Yeah. That's, right. That's being so much out of the way that you don't even know what you're talking about, but some of us get that way. <laughs> Come on, people. <clears throat> it's that four-inch pipe that's greased from your brain to your mouth, and we don't control it. But you know what? If you let God take that four-inch pipe, Amen. he can take what, that, what he gives you because we have to process it through our brain. Right. Brother Branham had to process everything through his brain except when he was in discernment. He didn't have to do that. What did I say? I barely remember. He, uh, you know, Billy Paul said, said for hours after he'd take him to the hotel, he just lay down in the bed because he was numb. Brother Branham said one time, he said, I was numb for days. After something happened. Can you imagine? Being numb and out of it where you don't even know where you're at for days. Just because what did you do? You moved yourself out of the way and let God take over. But now I believe though, coming to the end time right now, we're not going to be that way. I'm just going to tell you, if we come to a place of resurrection and we've come to a place of speaking the word of God, it's not going to hurt us like it did him. He was one man taking that whole load on him. Now that load's being dispersed. And I don't have to be William Branham. I can be myself and have my part in the body. You can have your part in the body. You can have your revelation and your resurrection and your power and your authority. But it all comes under the headship of that man right there. Now when we come out from under headship, what was the problem with Eve? She came out from under headship. What's the first person that was standing there when she came out of headship? Satan. He deceived the bride the first time she moved out of headship. That's what happened with the nominations. There was a Baptist bride, folks. Can somebody amen? amen. I'll read you a quote where Brother Brown said they had the word at one time. But what did they do? Moved out from under the headship of the word of God. Took their own ideas and run with it. That's why they're illegitimate. Brother Brown calls them prostitutes. Why? They moved out from under headship. They've done just what Eve did. That's why that we have now, in the end time, got to come back under headship of the Son of Man 
and be able to live this life. Is everybody okay with this? I want to make sure that we get I, I don't want you to know one thing for sure. Jesus wasn't wrong. We've heard preachers, well, I haven't heard, but I heard a preacher preaching one time that, that said Jesus did said things wrong. I, you know, he might have said Tuesday was Wednesday. I don't know, but he never, ever, according to the word of God, said anything contrary to his father. Now, listen, we do. Hello, somebody. We do all the time. But there's got to come down a time to where that's got to what? Take over. As it did that little... Five, put, five foot five inch man yes. from Kentucky yes. where he took complete control of his body. Amen. And one time he said, this is not William Branham you're hearing. Right. 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 He said, this is me. Right. Yes. I'm just using his voice. Amen. Please let him use our voice. Amen. If he uses our voice, we are then perfect. Yes. That's why I said, folks, we need to let out what we got inside of us. Let it go. There's a lot of things we really do need to let go. Amen? Now, us, look. The Bible in Romans 8 says that you and I, right? You and I, this adoption, we are to be manifested sons of God. Now listen, Jesus was the Son of Man, and that's what he manifested. Nothing different. Right? So the Son of God's been manifested down through church ages. Everybody okay with that? Get them saved, get them in church, get them to quit doing the things they were doing. But you see, you got Luther, you got Luther that come out of the Catholic Church, and God anointed him to do a job and brought people in the body of Christ sitting in a pub, right. drinking beer and smoking his pipe. Right. We can't do that because we've got a furtherment of the word. The book's been open. Right. The book wasn't open when he had it, right. when Luther was there, even when Wesley was there, right. even Pentecost. But what did Pentecost do? They were under headship. Yep. The Holy Ghost fell in 1906 as Luther Street. The word of God yes. Yes. to restore the gifts but what happened? They said, this is it. There's no more. So they stepped out from under headship. God said, I can't use you anymore because you've defiled yourself with man's ideas. So I'm going to bring a prophet on the scene. And that prophet's going to restore not just the gifts back in the church. The gifts were already restored. When Brother Brown came on the scene, he didn't have to restore the gifts. The gifts were already working. But what were they doing? They said, well, this is it. They'd get up and somebody go to shouting and speaking in tongues while the preacher was preaching. It wasn't in order. The prophet of God had to do like Elijah. <clears throat> when those prophets had beat the altar down, what did he do? He put them all, he restored fellowship, and he restored how to have a church. He restored fellowship. What a man that could talk to God. Like Brother Branham. I mean, come on, people. Have you ever had God come down and, and Brother Branham said, stand right there beside me and say, come and walk with me. Come walk with me. Now, he wasn't standing there physically, but you understand, when he was up there, you know, he was hunting and he, the, the deer did what they did, you know, they came up to him. Yeah. Remember? What did God say? Come and walk with me. Amen. And there was a prophet walking down, down a, a deer trail with God beside him. He so reverenced God to God felt comfortable with walking with him. God felt comfortable using his voice. God felt comfortable using his mind to write notes to preach us 1,100 sermons, which was God talking to us, not William Branham. That's why if you turn William Branham down, in the voice, you turn God down. Now the things he did, the things he did person, I don't care. I don't care if he got a date wrong. I don't bother. But what happened when he was out there? He got a commission to go back to Jeffersonville and open the book. That's good enough for me. 
And you, you can, you know, there's been all kind of dissertations on the cloud. Whatever you want to believe. I just, bottom line, he showed me God. He showed me how to get access to God. He showed me in the Word where no denomination ever showed me how to get to God. Nobody else showed me how to get to God. What he preached showed me how to get to God. And why? The why of it. Why? Because we were lost. Even though we had a, a, a decent understanding of religion in the Baptists and the Methodists and Pentecostals and different churches, we didn't have the full understanding. We'd live a peace and then a peace would be left out. We could live a peace and a peace would be left out. Luther lived a peace, but a peace got left out. Right? That's the same way with us. But see, the Bible says, but when the fullness is come. Not just faith, virtue, knowledge, and faith, and godliness. Brother Kindness. The headstone. That's why the Holy Ghost is up there, not down at the bottom. We know we get faith, we get the baptism of the Holy Ghost because it's the divine nature of God. We'll talk about that tonight, this afternoon. But that Holy Spirit seals that in. It, what does it do? It puts a stamp. Yes. This is my beloved son. Now you hear what he's saying. He put his stamp of approval on the mountain in Matthew and said, you got to hear this guy. Let's skip to that, brothers. Let's go to Matthew 17, verse 8. Real quick, because I want to get right here. <clears throat> then we'll start this afternoon. I hope this is helping us to realize what our commission is. Not just to come to church. That's what I was thinking last night. I said, Lord, have you ever been honest with yourself? He said, Lord, I didn't get anything out of that service. Brother Brown said, you either get better, you leave that door better or worse. I've left that door worse. Because I didn't pay attention to everything that was being said. I had stuff in my head. But you know what? There's days I walked out that door. Just like when Chris was preaching the other day, I wrote one word down. And I'll preach about ten sermons on that one word. And I'm going to tell you what I did. But it's got something to do with surgery. But I wrote that down. And, then you, and that's the way God works. So see, I had fellowship. I had fellowship with what? What, what he said, yes. that word I got. You probably got another one. You probably, can under, you probably can remember a phrase he said that I can't remember. Why? Because we're a body. Amen. We're a body, but when we bring it together, it's got a dovetail. Yes. It can't be like this. You can't, you can't hear what Brother Chris said and get a wrong doctrine if I heard him and got a right doctrine. Somebody's wrong. You both can't be right, as Brother Brown said. You both can't be right. So this is on the mountain. <clears throat> God had just identified and put a stamp of approval on Jesus in tight. Listen, he was Almighty God. But I believe he came to a place. He learned by the things he suffered and being made perfect. He's come to a place that now he can go to Calvary and say, not my will, but thy will be done. <clears throat> Everybody okay? All right, let's listen right here. <clears throat> when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. <clears throat> and as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision. What, let, in other words, tell what they, do not tell what you saw. Because right. so they were in a vision. Remember, they looked up and saw Elijah and Moses and Jesus. Had to be a vision. And then a, a, a cloud comes down and a voice out of the cloud. Okay. I like what Brother Chris is preaching. Well, I loved everything he's preaching, but the symbols. Watch those symbols. They're symbols, but they have a meaning to them. Everything has a meaning to it. Doesn't matter if you're in a concert with a thousand uh, musicians. Everybody's got a note to play. And if you toot when you're supposed to not, everybody can hear it, and it's off. Amen? When you're supposed to pause and somebody goes, boop. You know there's something wrong. Yes. All right, look. <clears throat> we'll be done right here. <clears throat> Sorry. Tell the vision to no man. Why did he say that? Nobody's going to understand it. 
Because Peter says, I have a more sure word of prophecy. I was on that mountain. I saw what happened. But I didn't understand what happened. Because Peter's wanting to build tabernacles, three of them. I bet he reversed his thought process when he got the Holy Ghost because he never mentioned it again except one time. He said, I have now a more sure word of prophecy. I was on the mountain that day. But see, the word of prophecy is now that Jesus is Almighty God. They didn't know he was Almighty God right here. They didn't have the new birth. You can't know that Jesus, you say, oh, I know Jesus is one, he's Almighty God. You're just quoting what somebody said. Until you get the new birth and then that speaks back out from you, you're just presuming. That's what Brother Brown said. He said, we, we, we're only presuming if he don't come and show us these things. <clears throat> Tell the vision of no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. So in other words, he had to die. He's going to be risen again because of this. And his disciples asked him, saying, why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? They went to Malachi. Malachi said, behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. They're quoting Malachi. Same scripture we're quoting. But Jesus said to them, Elias shall truly, I'm sorry, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. John the Baptist did not restore all things. He introduced the Messiah. He didn't restore. He turned them back. Sure, he turned some of them back. But see, that's why Brother Branham had to do the two things. The Elijah ministry had to do the two things. Turn us back to what? To where we can understand that we need these things. And then bring the headstone message. Not just bring a regular message. Let's go to Psalms 118. Magicians get ready to come and read about three scriptures. Then we'll start on that this afternoon. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused. Hmm. Which the builders refused. It's become the headstone of the corner. Become the headstone. They rejected him. They killed him. They cut him off. But he came right back down here on the day of Pentecost and started again to build his church back. Amen. He had a church in the Old Testament. They rejected him. Come out from under headship. Killed him, actually. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous. Listen, has this become marvelous? Has this become a marvelous message or is it just something that we do? And it's something to say, well, I got something that that guy don't have over there. No, you're wrong. You're like the Pharisee that stands up and says, Lord, I'm going to pray so loud that he'll drown that old guy over there out. He's just a sinner. He don't look at him. And, now, and, and like Jesus said, said look, look, there he is over there on his knees crying out to God for forgiveness. Okay. Ephesians 2 verse 19 says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now that puts you in the body. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Listen, he lowered himself down. He lowered himself down to be the head of the corner. What? The head of this new race. The head of this new church that was coming. Right. And they had their mistakes. He, he, went, he had to wink at Luther smoking a pipe and drinking beer. Right. But he said, Luther, you preach just so I live by faith. That's what I want you to preach because the people are going to get that. Right? right? <laughs> then he moved to Wesley. Okay. Now look. In whom all the building fitly Framed together, dies, withers. Oh, groweth. Oh, groweth. Oh, sorry. Groweth unto a temple in the Lord. Where is that temple? It's in your flesh. In whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved tabernacle in whom I am so pleased to dwell. He's so pleased to dwell that he's going to 
see you for an eternity and not be ashamed. The Bible says it's not be ashamed to call, his, call him brother, right? See your brother. Listen, there's not anybody going to get into that city, bride, and God say, I really didn't want them here. <laughs> I mean, really. Now, outside the city, he gives people eternal life. And I was thinking about this the other day, you know, we know that Jesus is coming soon. Is everybody okay with that? But it's a secret coming as a thief in the night. Listen, when the world says Jesus is coming on this day or coming on this, forget it. Amen. You and I are the only people we're just going to be caught away. Right. Now listen, I know we invited guests 40-something years ago. My lovely wife's watching in now 42 years ago, almost 43. But now they didn't all go on a honeymoon with us. It was just me and her. We invited all these guests. They got to come to the wedding. But there was one woman walked down that aisle, and I went home with that one woman. Man, yesterday, you bug, I got lonely. You can say all if you want to. Aw. She's been gone since Thursday, which was Thursday like seven or eight years ago. And I told the people at, at work, I said, look, I said, I got this friend and his wife's leaving him, and he needs some food. So I went and got me some food last night because June didn't fix me nothing because she wasn't there to fix it for me. <laughs> Bless her heart. So now listen, let me tell you this little story. So I get in the car, and I leave Commerce, and something just impressed me not to go the regular way home, which would be go down to Deadweiler or go to uh, um, Yarbers Crossing and turn and go through Maysville and come up to the house. Go to Homer. So I turned, went to Homer. That's where June and I were raised. I turned left on Yona Homer Road, and I went by the place that we first got married. The little trailer that we first lived. Mom and Dad helped us clean that thing up, and it was a pigsty. <laughs> right, Mom? Mama, I think, even gay. We literally opened the doors. This is, I want, this is a story. We literally opened the doors and took water and washed. But I got it for a good deal. And it was just me and her. We were so much in love. It didn't matter if we lived in a cardboard box. Would have been a little rough, but... But we found this trailer, and it was a mess, but we cleaned that up. And from that beginning, 42 years. 42 years. Oh, yeah, had our ups and downs, no doubt. But 42 years, I drove by that place, and I said, God, thank you. That I met a woman that would put up with me, number one. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, see, go ahead. Go ahead. See, they're all... To put up with me for 42 years. But think about God. God remembers the first day you got born again. The first day you said, I want you, God, to be my husband. It might have been in a little trailer. It might have been in a little shack. Brother Brown said it may have been out in the middle of the swamp. Right? But isn't that when you get married? It's when you accept God in your, in your life? And it was a simple time. We didn't have no kids. We could just throw clothes in the car and go see her mom and dad and, you know, be there in, in a couple, a few hours and we'd just throw enough clothes. And then when we started having kids, it took like a week for us to decide we wanted to go and then another week to get everything ready. And then six or seven days to get over there. It was only a four-hour drive. But you see how life is, though. Life became a little bit complicated. But still, I go back and remember. They sold the old trailer and put a double wide there, and it's still there, actually from the 40-something years since we lived there. But I thought, Lord, I'm horrible. I was a horrible person when June and I got married, but I loved her. And she loved me despite all the stupid stuff I did. That's how God does. He says, I remember you when you were young. I remember when I first went home with you. We first built our Christian experience together. I remember that. And I love it. I've loved you from the beginning. 
Doesn't matter what you do. You have your trials and tribulations. And now 42 years later, I know she's crying. <laughs> 42 years later, we're still in love. Amen. Like little kids, still in love. Why? Because now we got God in our life to tell us yes. how to love. Amen. You know, listen, you can have love out in the world and it becomes lust and all these different things, but you can't have agape love of God. And that world have anything to do with you. <laughs> and whom also are built together for an habitation. See, I built her a habitation. It may have been a rough place at first when we first had to sweep it and clean it out and get all the roaches out. But you know what? It was home. It was the house. It was warm in the winter. and No, it was warm in the summer and cold in the winter. Pretty much. <laughs> I don't even know if the furnace worked. But you know what? That's your humble beginnings. All of you's been that way. I hope all of you can remember when you got married. I hope you can all remember the day you got born again. Because it was way better than the day you got first married. But you know what? It parallels itself. God said he'd build you a habitation. He's going to dwell in you temporarily. I say temporarily, hang on a minute. But your real home is that future home he built before the foundation of the world. Built according to your desires. And it's somewhere in a dimension. Probably number seven, I say. It's in a dimension waiting till we can what? Heaven and earth can kiss. That's what we're looking for. Heaven and earth is kissed now between me and you and the, bride, you know, the, the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. But there's going to be a literal time. We're going to be able to walk with that man. He's built us a house. All those 42 years, June and I walked together. Like I said, trials and tribulations and troubles. But she's my wife. And that's just a pinhead. That's just a molecule of water compared to the ocean that God's going to give us at the new birth. But he's working in your flesh now. We are now sons and daughters of God. Not only sons and daughters of God, we're the bride of Jesus Christ. And he's built us a place. Let's read this one thing. You know, you ought to go back sometime. Go back to where you were, unless it's way off, but just kind of go back and reminisce a little bit. I know some people had terrible marriages. I'm sorry, but think about the day you got born again. How that the love of God came into your heart and you couldn't not love somebody else. You just love everybody. Let's read 2 Peter 1, 3 and the musicians, come on. According as his divine power, this is what we're going to get to this afternoon. Look, look at all this word. What is divine? There's only one thing divine. That's God. Nobody else is divine. One divine. According as his divine power has given unto us all things pertaining unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of that divine nature, having escaped the corruption, like I said before, that is in the world through lust. There is no lust in agape love. Now, filial love, there's a lot of it, but not in agape love, there is not. Musicians, come. We'll sing a song before we dismiss. But just think about what God's done for you. You truly get born again, that's when you start living. You're dead as a hammer until you get born again. You don't even know what you're doing. Amen? That's why I adjure you in the name of the Lord Jesus this year. Know that you know that you're born again because only the born again is going in the rapture. No one else. Let's stand our feet. Only the born again is going in the rapture. No one else. I want to see my bridegroom. Oh, I've met him spiritually. I've seen him in the Word. I've seen pictures of him. But I've never felt him hand to hand. Oh, we felt his presence. But we're going to literally be with him. Whatever you do on this earth, it, it pales in comparison to what's coming. We can have, we can, you know, Jim and I have had a good life. We've had a, a really good life. And, uh, but it doesn't compare to what 
Well, what if we were both just sinners, though? And we just loved each other with, with filial love. And then we just went through the world, had a couple of kids. And you know what? Then we just pass away. That's it. But no, we got born again one day. Amen. And that's an assurance of, number one, you're going to make it. And it's also an assurance that we had a prophet, thank God, that says you'll be with that woman for the rest of your, for an eternity. Amen. That'll be your wife. You'll know it for an eternity. Now, you won't be, I don't, you won't be doing things of nature, but that'll be your wife. Amen? Amen. That'll be the one. When our bridegroom comes, let's sing a song. Let's just sing that song. I just want to thank you, Lord. <clears throat> and I just want to thank you, Lord, for letting me hear your word. What have I done? That's what you say. What have I done to deserve this? You said yes one night or one day. You said yes, Lord. I'll accept that. I'll accept that life. Listen. Face to face with eternal life, Lord, I thank thee. Sing it again one more time. Oh, I just want to thank Thank you, Lord, for letting me even to listen to this. What have I done to deserve the glory revealed to me? Thanks for that special night when I saw your glorious light face to face with eternal life. Do this sometime if, if you want to. Take you a piece of paper and write down the things you thank God for. Just write them down on a piece of paper and just and just look at them. You remember this. You remember that. You remember He saved you from sin. Then He saved you from a car wreck. And he's, then He brought a, you know a husband in my life. Brought children in my life. Brought grandkids. That's what you thank God for. But the apex is that He lets you hear His word. And you responded to the word that he preached. 2,000 years ago, he didn't die in vain. He died to bring you eternal life. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you give us. Now I pray that you be with us as we go and eat a natural meal, Lord, to come back together, Lord, to hear from you. We pray that you'd bless the ones that are sick, Lord. If anybody here in the building that's sick, Lord, we pray that you'd instantly heal them now, Father. I know we all have needs in our life, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that the great physician will come into the building. Father, we pray that you'd bless each one, Lord, on the highways in different places. Take care of them. Be with the ones, Lord, that are, that are sick, that are not here, Lord, that you'll bring them back together in you. Father, we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. There's a river of life flowing out of me Makes a lane to walk